Deb Bree to introduce today's speaker. Great. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce Obed, who's an NSF postdoc fellow in my lab. Obed did his undergrad at Texas Tech, where he actually was in a mammal lab, and then switched over to Hellbenders, which is going to be very fun to hear about when he moved for his PhD to Purdue. Um, if you poll people and ask them for a fun fact about Obed, you will probably hear three things, well, maybe four. The first is just, he's the best, which isn't exactly a fun fact, but it's a fact. He's been a delight to have in our research community, extremely generous um, with his time and expertise, um, so thank you for that. You will also hear that he loves Doctor Who, and generally his outfit has something to do with Doctor Who, although I'm not, I'm not seeing it today, but he cleaned up for a busy lunch. Um, three is that he makes amazing salsa, and you have to actually sometimes fight for it in our lab <laughs> gatherings. And the last is that he is our proudly defending pie-eating champion. Um, and if you want to come out and try to best him, we will be hosting a Halloween party over on Mulford. And you can really see what a champ pie-eating contest looks like. And if you beat him, there is a big pumpkin pie stuffed animal that you win. But he is going to defend it hard. So you are forewarned. Obed, take it away. Thank you for that introduction. Great. Um, thank you, everybody, for having me today. I'm really excited to uh, showcase uh, my previous research, and then also I'm going to be talking about some of the research that I'm performing currently. So I'm really stoked to talk to you, but before I get into the research, I'd like to thank many people, uh, some of them that you recognize here. Uh, but, for example, Dr. Jeff Strickler, he's a current uh, Missouri State Herpetologist, and he has given me access to Osak albenders, which are an endangered, thoroughly endangered species of, you know, getting around that red tape. The wonderful um, Bree Rosenblum lab, uh, we're currently working, collaborating on a, on a project all together, and I'll be really excited to, for the first time, present some of the data that we produce. So thank you for helping in uh, project management or project planning and, and data acquisition. Um, two current undergrads here at UC Berkeley that are working with me, uh, Shannon and Albert, both of them have work or put in tremendous amount of hours to helping me in the laboratory and in the lab collecting uh, salamanders. And then uh, other collaborators, Jeff, Dr. Jeff Hua and her PhD student, Vanessa Werthner, uh, they're ecotoxico ecotoxicologists at Binghamton University, and they uh, tend to collect swabs from a video that they're performing experiments on. So thank you for all the awesome scientists. And of course, there's a lot more people um, in this list that keeps growing. So. OK, so today, I will be talking about community assembly. And I'll be discussing the ways that we can apply essentially community ecology theory to study host associated microbiota. But before we get into the, the nitty gritty or to, to talk about the, the microbiome, I'd like to first uh, sort of view uh, this model or theory through the eyes of vertebrate biologists, which most of us here are in the room. So usually there are two uh, types of forces that influence community assembly of animal uh, communities, and that they're regional and local community forces. And Regional forces are usually, or one of the regional forces that has uh, an impact on the distribution of species is dispersal. So if a species is able to disperse, they're going to come and inhabit an open uh, habitat. And we tend to have a regional species pool. So regional species pool essentially um, refers to a, a list of species that you tend to find in a specific landscape. Now, any species can disperse, right? If they have the ability to disperse, they can inhabit a, 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 a local community or a local habitat. But the ability of, for those species to effectively establish themselves is going to be di dictated by local factors. And these can be either abiotic or biotic filters that essentially filter out uh, what can survive and not in that community. Now, how can we apply this to uh, microbiotas and why is it important? Well, I would argue that microbiotas are, are a good system to evaluate this. And in the past recent, uh, about 10 years, we've actually acquired that technology to characterize whole microbial communities. In the past, we had to culture bacteria, and only 1% of bacteria are culturable, so you did not really get an idea of what the diversity is. But now we're starting to learn that there's a tremendous amount of diversity, both in the number of species and also in their functions. In addition, you can view host as open habitat patches, right? So hosts are moving in the environment, and bacteria are being transmitted across it. One cool thing about hosts is that they can actually also um, inhabit very different environments. 
and they can move between these environments. So we can actually track how external environments influence the, the host associated microbial communities. So I'm going to sort of uh, show this image again um, that I showed before, but this time in the terms of, uh, you know, of host associated microbes. So we have a regional species pool. Essentially, for example, if you're looking at a particular host, it's all the bacterial species that you can find in that host throughout its range. And then the, their dispersal <laughs> or, or, or curse, you know, across, across environments. But if you have two different environments, as I showed before, you can expect for these environmental filters to be different. And you're going, going to end up with very different uh, local species pools from where um, hosts can acquire their microbes from. However, because we're working with hosts as well, there are individual factors that we need to consider. <coughs> so, which complicates things a bit, right? Because we can move, we can move along this scale, going from a regional up to the, an individual level. Okay. So one of the things that uh, host-associated microbiome researchers are interested in is looking at how these different processes dictate what a community is going to be like, and how do these processes can create variation. Uh, in host associated microbial communities across the range. And I've actually, I'm interested in studying the host associated microbiomes of amphibians. And in particular, I'm interested in skin microbiota. And the reason why the skin is interesting is because it's a very important organ. For those of you who are not herpetologists in the room, amphibians use their skin for breathing, they use their skin for osmoregulation, but they also possess microbes in their skin that are able to provide important services. And one of these services could be defense against pathogens. And some microbes actually produce antipathogenic metabolites that are able to protect the host against pathogen invasion. Mm -hmm. Amphibians possess a very diverse uh, microbial community on their skin. So here in this particular hellbender, we were covered up to 18 different phyla of uh, microbes. And while most of the composition is comprised of maybe two phyla, which are which is typical in amphibian microbiomes with bacteriodates and probacteria. These phyla themselves are also very diverse in number of species and their functionality. Micro, microbes transfer among individuals. You can see horizontal transferring. For example, conspecifics living in the same environment, they can come into touch and microbes can disperse in between them. But there's also evidence in the literature showing that there might be some sort of vertical transmission occurring. Essentially, what their parents are passing on their microbes to their offspring. And then, uh, Amphibians also acquire microbes from the environment, so either through substrates or if, if they live in the pond, water bacteria um, that are able to colonize the amphibian skin. So there's multiple sources, essentially, what I'm trying to say, of amphibian microbes. So in 2016, Jimenez and Selmer actually published a, a, a really good synopsis of all the research that had been performed uh, to that point, and essentially set out different uh, goals for future amphibian skin microbiome studies. One of them is to characterize natural variation in the skin microbiota. Essentially establish a baseline of what are the differences that we're seeing within a population or among different species. <coughs> also evaluate natural and artificial sources of disturbance. So how does habitat loss, pollution, disease, or captivity influence the skin microbiota? And then we can, with that knowledge that we're acquiring, we can um, implement that, that information for disease mitigation. As I mentioned before, there are some bacteria that actually produce antifungal metabolites that kill pathogens. So taking advantage of that, maybe through the use of probiotics, and, it, and also captive breeding and reintroduction management. So if captivity indeed is a strong filter on host associated microbes, how can we mitigate that to uh, help our conservation programs? So today I will be focusing on, on the regional aspect, so essentially looking at uh, symbiont boundaries across the species range and what factors could influence these, and then also on local factors that influence the composition of micro community, and these are maybe environmental factors, or, or for example like pollution in the environment, um, or individual level factors, so what about the host dictates what bacteria can live on it or not. So let's start looking at the regional factor, and as I mentioned, we're going to be looking at uh, distribution of symbionts throughout the host range. So for my PhD, I had the, the pleasure of working with hellbenders. Hellbenders are one of three species in the family Cryptobrachidae, which are your giant salamanders, and they're actually the only giant salamander that exists in North America. And their range is mostly restricted to the eastern, northeastern United States. You have two subspecies currently recognized, the eastern subspecies, which has the larger range and with a <coughs> eastern population in Missouri, and then the Ozark subspecies, 
which are restricted to northern Arkansas and southern Missouri. And as I mentioned earlier, the Ozark subspecies is federally endangered. <coughs> so both sub subspecies have suffered population losses in the past 30, 40 years. Eastern Hellbenders actually presented themselves as a perfect opportunity to evaluate symbiont boundaries. And the reason is because they do have a very large range. Um, there are two genetically differentiated groups, the Ohio River drainage population, which inhabits the northern part of the range, and the Tennessee River drainage population, which inhabits the south. And microsatellite data shows that the, these populations are genetically different. So there is some sort of barrier to dispersal for the host. There's also a pattern, uh, strong pattern of isolation by distance. Uh, so among a stream, there's also limits to, to host dispersal. And because the range is so large, it actually encompasses uh, a, a lot of uh, different habitats. So for example, you can have some hellbenders up in the Appalachia where the forest is you know, pristine, the water's clean, or you can find hellbenders in the Midwest where farming has introduced a lot of silt into the environment. So they are, there, there is variation in habitat quality and, 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 and habitat characteristics. So in the summer of 2014, uh, I set out to sample pop multiple populations within each of the uh, su uh, subspecies range. And we were able to collect between five and 10 hellbenders at each of one of these locations. Now, before I go on, I do want to mention, if you've never sampled for hellbenders, it is a hell of a work. I don't, no pun intended. <laughs> but usually you need a team of multiple people, all wearing uh, snorkeling or scuba gear. And you have to have people who lift these large rocks that the hellbenders are from under, and then a brave soul that dives underneath that large rock and catches the animal. So it's, it's, it can be fun, but you can, yeah, you can get very tired. <laughs> so most of the time you don't find a hellbender. You <laughs> in Indiana, where I did my PhD, we only have hellbenders left in one river, and there's not a lot of individuals in the wild, so most of the time you've gotta, you, you find other cool stuff. As you can imagine, hellbender sampling is very labor intensive, and there's a potential for you to injure yourself or, uh, or the animals to get injured. And this happened to me on the third day of sampling for this particular project that I'm talking about, somebody dropped the rock on my finger and broke it. And I kept working during the day. I wasn't paying attention. The water was really cold, so I couldn't really feel that I had a broken finger. And I didn't go to the hospital until like 10, 11 p.m. that night. So you can get injured, but things work out. And that's like my, my, uh, like my message, you know, eventually you do find a hell there, you have a huge mile because you know that you are going to graduate. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if it was the fact that I found the biggest hell I've ever seen or that I was high on my drugs. I think that was the <laughs> so I my broken uh, finger right there, but, you know, I did catch them. So if you do manage to acquire enough samples, you come back to the lab. <laughs> and this is how uh, the way that we process our samples for microbiome characterization. So we... Uh, extract DNA from the, 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 the skin swaps, uh, and then amplify the 16S RNA uh, gene. And this is a genetic marker for which there's an extensive uh, bacterial database, you know, a lot of bacteria that have been sequenced for this gene. So we were able to, I mean, for this gene. So we're able to compare uh, our sequences to, to those databases to understand, to know what, what these are. These applicants then get barcoded and pooled and sequenced on a MySeq machine and then this, the, the reads are processed through Chime or Mother, which are bioinformatic pathways that cluster the reads by similarity. That we, and we, we call these clusters operational taxonomic units, or OTUs, which are synonymous with the species level differences. And essentially what Chime spits out, or Mother, is a OTU table. And essentially, it's a table with thousands of OTUs and then your samples. And this is important because I'm going to discuss a little bit about how we um, perform analysis on these tables. Next. We evaluate meta-community structure uh, analysis, and I'll discuss those details um, more in detail. So essentially what we're trying to do is to uh, characterize the meta-community and, and its structure. And then we also evaluated the role of environmental factors, and these are more regional factors, more regional patterns, uh, which include genetic theme, elevation, latitude, and land use. So, the meta-community structure analysis is, is, is very complicated. I'm going to you know, brief through the methodology, but I'm happy to sit down and, and talk to you if you're interested about how this is performed. But eventually what we do first is that we ordinate our OTU tables. And here is a, a sample OTU table where if a cell is colored, that means the, the species is present. If not, that means the species is absent. And what we do is we ordinate the samples 
by similarity. So we essentially are grouping these by similar uh, composition of bacterial species. And then the bacteria are also ordinated by their similar ranges. So these bacteria are ordinated by where, you know, where they are. So you, you end up with this cloud of points, uh, two-dimensional cloud of points. And then you calculate these three numbers, which are known as the elements of meta-community structure. And essentially what these numbers mean is coherence. You essentially are counting the number of empty spots or empty boxes within, within the cloud. And that's, that's coherence. Turnover is the times that a species, as you move down this gradient of, sem or of composition similarity, the, the, the times that a species replaces another. So here we have one, two, three, okay? And then boundary clumping eventually, essentially looks at the, at the boundaries of these OTUs and, and evaluates how uh, clumped these are. So do you have multiple species re being replaced or do you have one at a time? You use these three numbers, uh, essentially through this thinking tree, to uh, come, come out with your, your idealized meta-community structure. And essentially what these structures are telling us are, are some ecological or community ecology uh, processes that are going on. So I kind of give you a clue of the mechanisms. For example, if you end up with a checkerboard distribution or a checkerboard meta-community structure, that means that your species tend to be mutually exclusive. Wherever you have species A, you're not going to have species B. If you end up with a nested community structure, what that, what that tells you is that you have some communities that are very fertile and they possess a, a, a lot of species, but then others that are not varied. And then as you move through that gradient, you start losing species, but you don't gain any new species. So you just have some, yeah, some very fertile, some not so, so much. And then if you do have a species turnover, you might end up with something that looks like this. Here, what we see is replacement of species. So as we move down and up the gradient, we <laughs> see that species are being replaced by other species. Does that make sense? Awesome. OK, so here is ours. So it, it, it looks very complicated. There are thousands of OTUs along this, the, the columns. Uh, but essentially, when we <coughs> calculated our, our, our numbers, we ended up with a positive coherence, positive turnover, and greater than one boundary clumping. And if you go through that tree, what that tells us is that we have a Clementsian structure. So that corresponds with the species turnover that I was mentioning earlier. Essentially, what's happening, and I'm coloring this into two compartments so that it makes it easier to see, is that down here in this red compartment, we, halvenders are comprised by mostly these bacteria, and as you move up to the to the upper compartment, you see that the species are being comprised by the most. So it sort of mimics what we're seeing in the, in the model. So how, or how do the environmental factors come into play? So what, essentially what we did is we evaluated for differences between the two compartments, right? So what we saw was that latitude here had a negative correlation with the placement of species here. What that tells us is that this compartment the hellbenders that were sampled came from higher latitudes than the upper compartment. So we were able to see that there's differences and the latitude has an effect. Elevation also had an effect. So the upper compartment hellbenders came from higher elevation and the lower compartment hellbenders came from sites with lower elevation. Uh, and our land use, which we looked at for sand forest cover, really did not have a significant effect. Genetic deem was also not important. So what I've done here is I colored the species labels or the hellbender labels based on our genetic DEEM assignment. And we see that between these two compartments, there's no complete differentiation. So we know that the genetic DEEM is not important, and what's probably driving this, this pattern is probably changes in latitude and elevation. So what, what we see here is that we have uh, clumped symbiont species turnover. So as you move along that gradient of uh, hellbender similar or composition similarity, you do see that, that you, are, you are having some uh, turnover of OTUs. Um, and these could be due to climate <coughs> effects, so we do know that up in higher elevations, the habitat's better, and lower, the habitat's worse. Um, so it could be that there are some, some climate effects that are, that are going on, or, or it could be due to habitat quality. But one thing that was interesting is that these patterns actually are analogous to what we see with parasites. So there's some uh, studies out there looking at parasite correlations in terms of diversity and composition as you move up and down elevation or, or latitude. So be further further research to to see uh, how they parallel, and then also what is the effect of local processes? So we do see that there's turnover, and that climate patterns could be explaining it. So there could there be more fine scale measurements that we could make to understand what are the differences in composition uh, among our different individuals. So with that I'd like to move to a, a more habitat uh, specific approach. 
and uh, be providing examples of research that I've performed looking at vegetation <coughs> effects, so effect of invasive vegetation species in the microbiome, habitat type, where do you collect the salamanders could be important, whether you collect them at a lake or a pond, and then captivity status. So let's get started with vegetation. So this is one of the work that I've been performing in the past year in collaboration with the Rosenblum lab. Um, and essentially our hypothesis was that like, that na the vegetation type that we collect salamanders in, either native woodlands or exotic woodlands, could influence uh, environmental filters and therefore could lead to different microbial communities. And there's been some research showing that, you know, after you have, uh, or in invasive field plots compared to native field plots, you do see changes in abiotic characteristics such as moisture, temperature, pH. But also those, ve those invasive uh, vegetation could be bringing in some of their, their symbionts so you have the introduction of exotic symbiont species, or they could produce chemicals such as like allelopathic chemicals that disturb soil biodiversity. So there is some evidence showing that the soil could be different between these two sites. And I, I was fortunate enough that we do have some invasive species to, or, or vegetation species to, to research in this area. So for the, in the 1800s, uh, eucalyptus trees were introduced as an alternative source of lumber. And since then, they've created, you know, they've reproduced, they've created, a, uh, or there is a mosaic of uh, vegetation type in our area. Of, uh, in, even within our campus, right, we have some very old uh, eucalyptus strands, and then we're using the native oak as a comparison. Mm -hmm. And a previous member of this community in 2002 actually went out and, and Dob Sachs uh, characterized vertebrate diversity uh, in sites in Tilton that were dominated by eucalyptus or that were dominated by native oak. And they were able to see some differences uh, in the vertebrate. So we took his amphibian data and essentially revisited these sites that he had already picked 20 years later. And we focused our research on the California slender salamander. So what, <coughs> the reason why we chose the, the California slender salamander is because they are, you know, they live in the soil litter or on the <coughs> logs, they're in contact with the soil. So if the soil is different, then they should be acquiring some differences and we went to Tilden to perform this work. We collected swabs from the salamander skin, but in addition, wherever we caught a salamander, we also collected the soil under the log to evaluate if indeed there were differences in the soil microbiome. And because we used Dov Sachs's uh, sites, we controlled for elevation, slope, and slope orientation. So we made sure that our sites were you know, similar in, in, in these characteristics as possible. So first I'm going to show the um, soil data, and then I will show the salamander data. So we looked at differences in community diversity, so essentially how many uh, OTUs were covered from each site. And for the soil data, we did not find a difference, which we really didn't know what to expect uh, in terms of, uh, of diversity, but it was interesting to see that there were no differences. But unlike what we predicted, we did not find differences in the composition. So here I'm showing a, uh, an NMDS plot. Each point um, corresponds to a one soil sample and their coloration uh, tells you whether we collected from a eucalyptus site or a native oak site. And what we see, again, no differentiation between red or blue. So that was, that was interesting that we didn't really see differences there. When we look at community diversity in the salamanders, we do see that salamanders collected from oak dominant uh, sites actually possess richer communities than those coming from eucalyptus sites. So it was really, really cool uh, to see that. But when you look at composition again, again, now the points correspond to the individual salamanders, we see no differentiation going on. So that was, that was pretty, uh, that was a bummer, but I mean, yeah, that's what we found. <laughs> interesting though, the, interestingly though, we also uh, collected body condition data of, of, on these salamanders. And what we found was that uh, here's body condition and then our two different uh, sources. What we see is that oak dominates uh, California cylinders actually uh, had higher body condition and indices than the eucalyptus dominant. So there's some something going on, and I'm really, really excited to sit down with the lab and, and, and start cracking uh, through this. So what eventually what we see is that there is no effect of invasive vegetation on environmental microbial reservoirs, with a caveat that we sampled under logs. So it could be that the the effect of these um, these trees is not you know it's not evident in, in the soils that are living under a log that might have been there for a while. But we do see lower skin microbial community on salamanders recovered from the eucalyptus habitat and also lower body condition. So there's an interesting correlation there. 
what I think is going on is that maybe bigger salamanders can carry more microbes. Uh, but it'd be it'd be interesting for us to, to, to keep thinking about about that. This is something not new. Um, but an, an alternate uh, explanation could be that the, the living in eucalyptus does make the salamanders um, or uh, influence their health in some way, and and therefore they 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 show that through through a loss of bacterial diversity. So there's something that we be we will be working on more <laughs> um, to to find an explanation for. So let's switch over to habitat type. So as I mentioned before, um, we, if we sampled salamanders from different habitats, for example, a low rake or a lentic habitat, we could expect for those to have very differences, so even bigger differences than maybe an, uh, the invasion of a, of a, of a, a vegetation. So I, last spring I had the opportunity to swab some Pacific mutes um, in two different habitats, actually, in the rhythm within a day from each other, I collected some, some mutes or, or tarika from a pond and a stream. And this was performed at Mid Peninsula uh, Regional Open Space. There's actually a really cool population there that still has red bellies uh, mutes. So we collected some of those red belly mutes in this uh, population. And then also some uh, California and the, the Ruskin mutes. I'm grouping the <coughs> California Ruski newts together because it's really hard to differentiate them by species. Um, so you'll, you'll see them uh, group. And then we, within a few miles, we sampled a pond uh, where we collected uh, the California or Ruski newt as well. And then, surprisingly, uh, what we see is, here's lake or stream where the salamanders came from, and then richness. What we see is that uh, needs that we sampled in the stream had up to three times more diverse microbial communities than those coming from the lake. So that was a really cool uh, uh, pattern to see that the stream uh, some matters are possessing uh, more. Oops, going the wrong way. And then when we look at composition, so here's another N NMDS plot. The points correspond to salamanders, colors to whether we recovered it from a lake or a stream. We see clear partitioning. So there is no doubt the communities are very different. So they're more diverse, but they're also there's, there's a lot of uh, turnover occurring between uh, these two <laughs> sites. Let's see. So one of the, uh, or, or my theories as to uh, what might be going on is that the salamanders in the stream kept moving in and out of the stream. So they, they would be swimming, they would be walking, and I just believe that they might be exposed to a greater number of uh, uh, bacteria than the ones in the lake. So we do have some soil samples that I, I still need to, to look at. It'd be interesting to see how those compare. <coughs> and we collect a substrate in the stream and in the, in the pond. And then uh, what I'm interested in, or the question that, that arises is, how does this structure affect community functionality? And I'll be talking later in my talk more about how I uh, attempt to, to investigate this answer. But if the microbiota, and again, this, this, these, have, these salamanders were collected within two, three miles of each other, right? If the microbiota is so different, how does the, the functions that the microbiota provide to the host, be it through pathogen defense, or maybe secretion of, of a secondary metabolites, how does it differ between these two sites? And it's, yeah, so it's something that we be, we'll, we'll be looking more into, and I'll talk again uh, later. So let's move to, uh, to what I consider a big habitat, uh, like an extreme habitat change in its, its captivity. So we're gonna go back to my Hellbender work for this. So as I mentioned before, Hellbender populations are dropping uh, across the country. And across the country, a, a bunch of, uh, uh, of the states where the Hellbenders occur are actually establishing captive breeding programs. And I would argue that the most successful program out there is uh, one that is a collaboration between the Missouri Department of Conservation and the St. Louis Zoo. And the reason is because they've actually built four um, uh, artificial rivers two indoors and two upstreams, but they actually are having hellbenders breed in captivity. And if you ever want to like read about this and how complicated it was for them to, to be able to do this, it's actually a, a really cool uh, a story. But they, they are producing their own hellbenders in captivity. They also collect hellbender eggs from the wild and they bring them into captivity. So if you ever have the chance to go to the St. Louis Zoo um, and, and, and you can see the hellbender collection, you will see thousands and thousands of hellbenders that are being reared in captivity. And in captivity, hellbenders are reared in aquarium. 
and they are kept in these conditions for about four to six years until they're no longer, you know, they're <coughs> taken up for release, and then they're released into the wild. And you can imagine that the captive and wild environment is very different. Uh, right out of the way, I mean, right, right, right here you can see that in the, in the river there's flow, you know, there's water movement, in captivity there's not, they're in a still tank. Um, there's also multiple sources of, of microbes that are being entering the stream or that are in the stream, for example, other amphibians, other reptiles, fish. And then the diet is also very different. So in captivity they're fed usually commercially bought diet, in the wild, they're eating crayfish and, and, and fish and insects. So what, what I did is I proposed to the zoo uh, to let me sample some of their albiners, and they were generous enough to let me come in and, and swab uh, albiners of both subspecies. And then I, I actually had some samples from a previous project um, from hellbenders in the river where those eggs were collected from. So we have Ozark hellbender, the 11 Point River, and for the Eastern hellbender, the Big Piney River. Um, the salamanders that we sampled in the in the zoo were, you know, eventually with the plan on releasing them into these rivers as well, because that's where they came from. And here is a principal core analysis showing the the composition of difference that we saw. I um, any points that appear as a square correspond to an eastern hellbender. Uh, points that are a circle corresponds to the Ozark. And then I colored the points that uh, are captive, coming from captive, and then uh, left open the points that are coming from the wild. And immediately, the partition that you see is by color, right? So you see that wild hellbenders and captive hellbenders possess very different microbiomes. This is something that we expected given the reasons I gave you before. But what we were interested in is if the microbiomes are different, how about the functions that they are providing to the host? And we didn't perform any. Um, any methods that allow us to look at functions, but there are some shortcuts that you can take with the data that we work with. So again, I'm producing 16S Amplicon data, <laughs> but there is a, a program called PyCrest where you can input that 16S data. What the program does, it compares your sequences to sequences in a database with sequence genomes and, you know, and annotated uh, functions, and it essentially produces a predictive metagenome that you can look at differences in functionality. Now, some people might argue this is cheating, but I mean, this is this is the best that, that, that we have to evaluate um, <coughs> function, functionality right now. So, what we did is we did an indicator species analysis to essentially evaluate uh, which genes <laughs> associated with eastern captive or wild, also are wild or captive. And here are the number of essentially metabolites or genes that are being associated with each of these classes. So these are significantly associated because they were significantly abundant in, in, in those groups. If we look at the cellular processes that these genes are associated with, one striking um, pattern that we see is that the majority of genes that are being associated to each of these classes are, are associated with metabolism, cellular metabolism. And if we look look deeper into the functions that are associated with these genes, what we see is that wild hellbenders were associated with multiple different types of, of metabolism pathways, going from amino acid, uh, biosynthesis of secondary metabolites, carbohydrate metabolism, energy, so that in some ways they had a very diverse uh, metabolic uh, capacity, whereas a captive hellbender microbiome, uh, most of the genes were involved in xenobiotic bond degradation, so meaning um, biodegradation of antibiotics or, or phenol uh, chemicals that they might encounter in captivity. So it's interesting that even though we use the predictive meta, metagenome approach, we, we, we could um, see some patterns that actually made sense. And essentially, as I mentioned before, what we're seeing is that oh, captive hellbenders possess less metabolic diversity in their skin microbiome. Mm -hmm. And one of the things to consider is that this, this may make them less resistant um, or, or more susceptible when we release them because their microbiome might be more susceptible to disturbance, um, and disturbance could be infection with a pathogen. So therefore, we have to evaluate ways to assimilate captive and wild microbiomes. Um, and I'll be discussing some forms later in my talk. So finally, let's look at the last level of, uh, of assembly, which is habitat, uh, I mean, host-specific. So these are factors that apply to an individual host. And the one filter that I was interested in investigating was in immunogenetics. 
And to tell you why, let's go back to some of the Hellbender work that I've performed in the past. So we know that Hellbenders actually uh, are involved in very violent and aggressive uh, territorial bouts, and these tend to occur around the, the breeding season, where when males might be defending their, their breeding territory. But one of the patterns that we've seen in the past 20, 30 years is that Eastern Hellbenders, for the most part, recover. So it's, you know, it's, it's common to find a help, uh, an Eastern Hellbender that might be missing a limb, but that wound is closed. However, with the Ozark species, what we started to, to see is that uh, those wounds actually become chronic and sometimes necrotic. And just to give you an idea of what you might find if you sample for Ozark Hellbenders in Missouri, is you might find wounds that might start out as, as, a, as a small sore in the hand or feet, but then eventually these wounds progress. And here's an example of an of individual. Here's the tail, cloaca, and the two rear extremities where that wound has, the wounds have consumed both, both feet. And then it's also uh, common to find wounds on the face. So here you can see that the, there's degradation of the mandibular bone already. So it's been a, a, a puzzle that, that the Missouri Department of Conservation has been trying to solve. And they've tested for BD, for rhinovirus, and none of these uh, pathogens are able to explain. So one of the theories that I had at the beginning of my PhD is that, well, it could be that Ozark Helbiners have reduced immunocompetence, uh, and that they just are not able to clear uh, the opportunistic infections as well as Easter's. So we decided to evaluate one gene that is involved in immunocompetence is the major, major histocompatibility complex genes. Uh, essentially what these genes do is they, you know, they code for proteins that are involved in the presentation of antigens to the immune system. And one of the long um, theories that have, that have been, uh, that, that are understood to, sorry. Okay, so. <laughs> One of the, what the things that we think are happening is that Ozark Helbenders have less diverse MHC uh, genes than Easterns. And the reason is based on this heterozygote advantage hypothesis, which essentially states that if you're a heterozygote, you're going to be able to recognize uh, a, a more diverse set of, of taxa than if you're a polycycle. So we believe that maybe the alleles that Ozark Helbenders possess are, are less different and they're not, are not able to recognize as many pathogens as Eastern Helbenders. So, we also know that the MHC, in particular the class 2B uh, locus, is involved in protection against BD. And this is uh, Kelly Samudio um, and her student at the Ana Savage produced a, a paper looking at, at, at the effect of, or, yeah, of BD pre historical presence on a population and, and changing in, the, in allele frequencies in those populations. Um, in addition, there's a lot of work currently being performed looking at uh, members of the skin microbiome that are able to produce, as I mentioned before, antifungal metabolites. So we know that there's a connection there, but one thing that has really not been explored in the literature is looking at whether the MHC have an influence on the skin microbiome. And this is something that I um, had the opportunity to test, uh, and, and for this we went back to Missouri because we know both subspecies are, are, are present there. It's the only state in the country where you can find them. Um, present, but not, not St. Patrick. Um, and we sampled hellbenders from each of these populations. And we essentially performed the same 16S methodology, but we also did some amplicon sequencing <coughs> to characterize the MHC. So we essentially took blood, extract the DNA. We created um, primers that would work with hellbenders for, to characterize the MHC, and then um, uh, sequence those amplicons in the MySeq, and then use uh, standard bioinformatic pathways to genotype them. Again, I'm happy to discuss these methods after with anybody who's interested. So one of the things that we, we, we did see is when we compared MHC amino acid divergence between e Ozarks and Easterns, we did see that uh, Eastern Hellbenders possess more diverse uh, MHC than the Ozarks. And this was really exciting because it actually provides one of the first concrete explanations as to why we see chronic wounds in Ozark Hellbenders and not in Easterns. In addition, we uh, looked at how the MHC in each of the populations that we sampled influence the skin microbiome. And in one population here, the Niagara River population of the Eastern Hellbender, we saw that amino acid diversity, so here low amino acid diversity is uh, brownish color, uh, high amino acid diversity is green. We can see that along this major axis of variation, the brown and green are separating. So essentially the, the uh, Hellbenders that possess no amino acid diversity have very different microbiomes composition than the, uh, the Hellbenders that possess greater amino acid diversity. 
In another population, we evaluated uh, or we saw uh, important or significant associations between the, uh, allele presence, absence, and microbiome <coughs> composition. So here's an example from the North Fork of the White. We saw that the presence or absence of allele 2 uh, had a, a, an effect. So we see that clear partitioning based on, on, on the pre allele presence. So this was really exciting because it provided, you know, a, a, a kind of a link uh, be between these two. Uh, but at the same time, it kind of complicates a lot of the research uh, that's going that's going on. But at the same time, we, we were able to, to see that there is a connection and an interaction going here. But the MHC are not the only gene, right? So it's really cool to know that there are individual factors, but the MHC are not the only gene in the immune system uh, that, that is relevant. So there's, there's a lot more work that needs to be done to fully understand what individual factors are shaping what bacteria can colonize the skin or not. So I know I've talked a lot uh, about the importance to evaluate regional and local influences, and I've showed a lot of results but I, I, I'd like to take some time to briefly go over uh, some of the applications and some of the new research that I'm performing looking at how we can apply this. And one of the, the things that I'm currently, uh, or projects that I'm currently working on is looking at the effect of experimental venues on the microbiome skin community composition. Right now we, we are at the, at the dawn of, of a, a scientific um, field of study. Um, there's not a lot of papers looking at it, maybe effects of environmental contaminants on the skin microbiome. And because of that, I don't think we, we have established a, a common uh, approach to do this. And just to give you an example, here are three different experimental venues that can be used uh, in, in amphibian skin microbiome uh, experiment, experiments. One can be a culture pool, so essentially it's, it's a tub with water that's left in the environment. Uh, it could be a mesocosm, so they add substrate uh, or, or vegetation to it to kind of mimic or it could be a sterile laboratory uh, experiment where there is no, no input um, from external microbes. And what we see, what we essentially did is we characterized the microbiome of uh, northern leopard frogs as they were moving through these habitats. And we see here in this NNDS that there's clear partitioning going on. So depending on where you are, you might be uh, working with very different microbial communities. So one of the things that we're recommending uh, in, in a paper that we recently submitted to Journal of Herpetology is the importance of uh, common husbandry practices. So essentially trying to establish a, a, a con consistency across, uh, across future studies that are coming up. And also uh, looking at the importance of environmental res reservoirs. Again, environmental reservoirs might be the, the way to, um, to assimilate uh, captive and, and wild microbiome. We've done some experiments as well with hellbenders uh, trying to introduce environmental reservoirs into captivity. So what we did is, we it, it, with captive hellbenders, we exposed them to increasing concentrations of river water over five weeks. Um, here we see a, a principal core analysis plot where each point corresponds to a hellbender, and then those colors, uh, the circles that are filled are treatment, which were exposed. The circles, the open circles, are control samples. And what we see, I'm just going to go through all the weeks, as we added environmental water, we did create a change. So our, our treatment group differed. However, uh, we released these helpers, collect them a week after, and re them. And what we see is that the direction, or at least compared to, to them being in the wild, the microbiomes were very different. So we might have elicited some change, but it was in no way in the direction that we wanted to go. And these black boxes are the river water that we were exposing the hellbenders to. So we looked at the microbiome as well. And as you can see, it overlaps with the skin microbiome after, re after being released and spending a week in the, in the river. But it does not, yeah, it doesn't create an effect. So that was a little uh, puzzling, but at least we can show that we've created some, some effect. Um, and we also tracked uh, white blood cell counts of these individuals at every <coughs> week. So here we see the, the six weeks. Um, here's a proportion of, of lymphocytes in the blood. And one interesting pattern that we saw was that, you know, at the beginning they started off the same, then I guess they acclimated to their, to their environment. Um, and then as we see that water exposures increased, the treatment group lymphocyte proportion of lymphocytes shot up. And then once in the once released into the wild and recaptured, it went down. But then we saw this pattern of, of it shooting up once uh, in the control group, once they were uh, in the river. So what this suggests is that there, we might have while well, we did not assimilate the microbiomes, we might have done some immune system training um, that, that might have been beneficial. Uh, however, we, 
cut out our experiment at, at week six, and we really didn't track for long-term survival um, patterns. So this is something that, that really needs to be investigated in terms of how assimilation and captivity affects survivorship once they're released in the wild. And then one project that I'm really excited uh, in, to, to start um, is one working with my undergrad, Shannon Budimer. Uh, she is very interested in uh, studying bacteria that prevent the growth of amphibian skin pathogens, such as BD in this case. And we know that we see differences in habitat, you know, across habitat types. So one of the things that we will be doing is sampling across the Bay Area from multiple habitat types and essentially evaluating for differences in, um, or the effect of, of these factors on the function of, functional groups. And part of this research, or part, part of why we're interested in doing this is because we know, um, I don't know how many of you are associated with or know about B cell, which is sort of like the sister or cousin of, of BD. Uh, so it's essentially a salamander-based chytrid that is affecting salamanders in Asia. And here is a map showing the susceptible areas in the country in our, our area because of, of the climate and also the, the presence of, of ports is actually very susceptible. And our species have been tested and they're also very susceptible to the fungus. So we kind of want to uh, establish a baseline as to what is the current distribution of, of symbionts that might help you know, mitigate this, this disease from spread. So now that I've given you all this information, I'd like to go back to the, the points I made at the beginning, which were my research goals. Um, we know that at the regional scale, we do see discrete symbiont boundaries throughout the host range uh, that could be or could not be uh, associated with climate differences across a large range. And then at the local scale, habitat characteristics are important predictors um, to, of, lo of local species pools. <coughs> But then also we've seen evidence that whole specific factors are also important. There's a lot more work that needs to be performed. And with that, I'd like to thank you. Thank everybody that's helped uh, collaborators, people have given me access to their property and funded me. And I'll open the floor for questions. Okay, we have time for questions. I'll let you call on people yourself. In instances where you see a turnover in the microbial communities with the skin, both in the terms of your uh, latitudinal altitude and also your uh, other experiments where you're changing the environment, do you normally see like stepwise changes where it's a gradual accumulation of bacteria and the order does not matter? Or do you see these patterns where you have a key bacteria species that seems to colonize, sets a new environment of the skin microbiome, and then other bacteria can then colonize that? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So essentially what you're asking is whether you have um, gradual changes as you move from one environment to the other, or is it just right. is relative? Right, discrete states. Yes. Um, from what I've seen, and, and most of this data is, uh, is actually providing you relative abundance, right? So you don't have um, abundant, uh, absolute abundance numbers. So what we see is that there is a, a, a change in the relative abundance for some species for example, in that mesocosm culture pool laboratory, we saw that in the mesocosms there was one species that became dominant, so there was some sort of uh, maybe advantage for, for it. Um, and then once we brought it into the laboratory, it kind of settled down. So, the, so there are relative changes, but I can't really talk about absolute abundance uh, because my methods do not allow me to do that. Can you talk about the presence absence of OTUs? Uh, for yes. example, in your altitudinal study. Yeah, well, with that altitudinal study, what you're seeing is that as you move down or up the elevation or, or, or latitude, you are seeing that there is turnover. So the, the Clementian or the clump species turnover refers to that you do have OTUs replacing other OTUs. Okay. That was great. Um, so especially interested in the Petragoseps research you did up in Tilden. And because eucalyptus is known to be sort of a natural pest repellent and also make, it's supposed to make things really acidic. I wondered if you, if that might be one of the reasons that the animals had different body conditions when the eucalyptus is present or not. But like, has anyone tested whether their prey are less abundant in the eucalyptus areas? And is the soil actually more acidic where, as you were looking under the law? Yeah. So that's one of the things. Yeah, I think I think I remember in, in like preparing the proposal reading that, that it, there might be an effect on invertebrates, but we didn't measure this. And with Shannon's project, one of the things that I'm considering is actually collecting soil and sending it in for analysis to, to see if the pH right. differs and, and try to characterize it, but we haven't thought really about looking at 
right? But that would be that sort of awesome explanation, yeah. Um, for the help render work that you did, when you found kind of uh, you labeled different themes and looked at uh, bacterial community diversity. I'm curious, did you ever look at kind of connectivity, um, by rivering connectivity between themes? Like, did that affect it? You would predict maybe the, you know, regardless of the habitat type along a river, maybe within the river it's similar? Yeah, uh, I don't think I had enough samples within a stream uh, to do that. Most of our, our my samples all arise from the same site. Uh -huh. um, but it would be interesting to see you mean within a, within a river, right? Yes, were the deems then all separate, completely separate rivers, or are they interconnected? They, they are, I would argue not, uh, because the Tennessee River, which is where all the Tennessee River mm -hmm. themes, uh, or, or, yeah, rivers empty into in the Ohio, is a guaranteed um, barrier to dispersal uh -huh. for hell rivers, because they, they wouldn't be able to survive uh -huh. in that environment. But, yeah, given that I, if, if I would have had more samples, it would be really cool to see how like, maybe inner, maybe more fine scale stream distance and influences. Yes. I wonder if you've considered the possibility of, of, of microbiome inoculation for those uh, lab-raised hellbenders in, in, uh, from the Ozarks. Yes. Uh, would there be any possibility of, inoc of giving them an inoculation? before they're released? Yeah, but I, so the Missouri State Herpetologist is extremely against inoculation, and he, mm -hmm. he would not be a fan of that, and I did propose it. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but it looks like we need to look, and I, I think when you look at functionality, so a lot of the probiotic work, let me go back, a lot of the probiotic work that's being performed in amphibians right now is being um, performed where you colonize one bacterial species on the amphibian skin. And I would argue that the more, the more research we do, the more we're starting to learn that this might be a more community effect. So it would be really interesting to maybe look at, at um, community, whole community self-organization, but then what makes up a good community? It's really hard. One of the other things that I've proposed, at least in my papers, is maybe, um, so helping nurse to perform parental care, the father will stay behind and actually raise, uh, raise the, the larvae, at least until they're a year old, they, they will leave the nest. So maybe raising <coughs> wild or captive larvae along with the parents or having shared shared water, that might be a way to inoculate them. Um, but we really don't know how important environmental versus vertical transmission is and where the majority of the bacteria is coming. So yeah, it's uh, something that needs a lot more work to do. Yes? I'm wondering <clears throat> what's known about any differences between uh, the microbiota on the surface of the skin and what's on internal to an individual. Um, on the organs, in the organs, and, and how that might be involved in their survivability. Yeah, I guess because of, of, of BD, most of the microbiome work has been performed in the skin, but there are, there's now more work looking at gut. I think one of the theories out there is that essentially amphibians tend to eat their skin, so there might be a seeding going on where the skin seeds the gut, the gut seeds the skin, mm -hmm. and there might be a cycle, but we really need a lot more research to, to see what those differences are. I was thinking about the diversity that you found for the MHC uh, class two, and I was thinking that couldn't couldn't that be just because the Ozark population is so small, so they are they are bottlenecks, and that's it's correlated with uh, you know some physical appearance or susceptibility, but uh, it might be not a direct effect. And, and I w in terms of a direct effect, I was wondering if you looked at, uh, for example, concentration of antimicrobial peptides on the skin that might be more directly relevant for chances of infections. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, so I completely agree. I think looking at AMPs is important, and there could be. Uh, one of the things that we did is that we only sampled Eastern Hellbenders from Missouri. So if you notice on that range map, there was also a very disjunct population that's separated fr from them. So I would argue that both Easterns and Ozarks have been suffering, um, that could suffer loss in the MHC. Uh, and then to answer your second question, um, the, there is currently a, a PhD student out of Eastern Tennessee University who's looking at AMPs, differences between the two subspecies as well. So there's some research being done as well to, to see if that's involved, yes. Okay, oh, oh, one more so question on that. Um, your study of the hellbenders, like trying to inoculate them basically with river water, showed that the river water and the uh, native in-river microbial communities were very similar. Um, 
how much overlap is there between the skin microbial community and the community around it in general? Do you have a sense for that? Yeah, it can range. Um, so at least in what I've seen, because I, usually when I sample an amphibian monster sampling this environment, with water you can have between 20, like around 20% overlap. Um, but that's hard to, to tell because there's also work that has shown that the, the skin or the microbes that amphibians acquire from the environment is actually very rare in the environment. So it could be more, more than that, it's just that I can't pick it up with my method. So they tend to acquire bacteria that are rare in the environment but abundant on the skin. But I don't know, I couldn't tell you that's for sure. All right, let's thank Obed once again.